Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, results strategist, business coach, mentor, and consultant. Today, I have an awesome guest. He is a serial entrepreneur, and with his latest venture, Handwritten, he's bringing back the lost art of letter writing through scalable, robot-based solutions that write your notes in pen. Developed as a platform, Handwritten lets you send notes from your CRM system, such as Salesforce, the website, apps, or through custom integration. Used by major meal boxes, e-commerce giants, nonprofits, and professionals, Handwritten is changing the way brands and people connect. Prior to starting Handwritten, he founded Salit, a leading mobile marketing agency, which was sold to Hello World in 2012. Welcome, David Wax, and thank you for being on my show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a true honor. Awesome, mate. Um, it's so awesome to have you here. I'm sure you're going to provide huge amounts of value for all the watchers and listeners today. So you're a very successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, just please introduce yourself and by telling us about you and your journey. Yeah, sure. So my name is David Wax. Um, I've been an entrepreneur since about 2004. Prior to starting that, I uh, graduated um, with a degree in engineering and business from the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, and then went on to be a consultant and an investment banker, uh, and then got involved in venture capital. <clears throat> and then I had this very bad experience where I got fired and car accident, all this stuff happened, and I ended up kind of not knowing what to do next. So um, I started a text messaging company called Sell It that did uh, this is back in 04, so before the iPhone, and we allowed people to connect and get information on houses by texting in. Um, they would text a, a, a number or a word like house five to a five digit number, and then they would get information on the house and the realtor would get the lead. So the idea was, imagine you're walking by a for sale, uh, for sale sign, there's a house and a for sale sign, but there's no info on that house. How can I get information quickly because the flyer box is empty? So you would text in, you get info on the house, the realtor would then get your info to call to call you. Um, so that the real estate side never really went anywhere. But at the same time, I started uh, an offering for restaurants and nightclubs and bars. Um, and that ended up being used by major retailers, Abercrombie & Fitch, Toys R Us, Sam's Club, a division of Walmart. Um, Office Max, the list goes on. So we were doing millions of text messages a day for major retailers. On and then we worked with Auto Trader and a bunch of other brands as well. Um, in 2008, I sold that company to Hello World. Or sorry, 2010, I sold that company to Hello World, and then I had to work with them for two years. Um, and then when that was up. I was a free man, didn't know what to do again. And uh, what I had realized is I was a kind of a part of the problem. The world had changed a lot over there, uh, over those uh, eight years that since when I sold, sell it, uh, started sell it, uh, leaving it. And in that time, people were now inundated with electronic communication. So they'd get 140 emails a day. They'd get 60 text messages a day. Uh, and then you're adding things like Slack and Twitter and Telegram and Facebook messages and all these other forms of communication on top of it. And it all just becomes noise. So what I wanted to do was figure out a way to break through that noise. And I noticed that when I received a handwritten note, I would always not only read it, I would treasure it, I would keep it, and I would put it on display. And then I'd walk around to my other employees at my last company's job at my last company's office, and I'd see the handwritten, handwritten notes they received put on display. So I thought there has to be a way to automate this so that I can make it appear as if I hand wrote notes to all my customers, clients, contacts, but being a lazy 30 something, um, I wouldn't actually have to do it. And that, that's how I started handwritten. Um, so what handwritten is, it's a combination of software and robotic technology on the, on the, inbound, you know, people go to our website and they um, enter who they want to send a handwritten note to, or they use our face, our integrations for uh, Salesforce or whatever else. 
And then we use robots to convert that into a very authentic looking handwritten note that's written in ballpoint pen. We've got 140 some odd robots now. It's a patent pen, it's a patented uh, robot that we build here in our facility in Phoenix, Arizona. The robot holds the real pen and we do it uh, 150,000 notes a month currently. So um, it's, it's grown quite nicely over the last few years. And I've been doing that since uh, 2012. Amazing. What an amazing story. I love that. And, um, you know, let's start. I'm sorry, with- 2014. My dates are all off. <laughs> I've, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit silly. 2014, I started the company. 2014. All good, mate. Um, you know, I'm sure once you being a serial entrepreneur like yourself, the dates sort of mix in when you've been the doing dates, it for a while. It all blurs. And I have two young kids at home. So everything blurs quite, uh, quite rapidly. That's all right. Well, um, time flies when you're having fun a lot of the time, as they say. So I'm sure you've been yeah. enjoying the journey as well along that. So um, that's really awesome. And, you know, you, you know, it's a big feat to sell a company, right? And you sold sell it, you know, after scaling it for eight years, as you said, yeah. and, you know, it was recognized as, you know, one of the top 500 faster growing companies yeah. in America, right? So, you know, very successful to do that. Not a lot of people, you know, do that. So what I'd just like to hear initially is, you know, what key learnings did you take from the experience of scaling it and selling it that you can share, you know, with everybody listening? You know, in both ventures, in both Sell It and Handwritten, we never really took any funding. We had one investor in Sell It, um, and we had a disagreement of what we should use the money for. She came from the real estate space. She literally wanted me to use the money, I'm not joking, to buy more candy for our booth at the real estate trade shows. She wanted me to spend more on these realtors that didn't convert into real money. I wanted to use that money for Google ads, which saw a huge potential. I mean, we got Marie Claire magazine from a Google ad very early on and, and some very, very large clients from these Google ads. And I wanted to use the money for that. So I quickly refunded the money and I grew profitably and slowly. And, you know, is that the right solution? For me and my personality, yes, because I don't like reporting to other people. For other people, maybe not. But what I learned by doing that is how to grow profitably, how not to overextend, how to incent people to work with maybe not a huge paycheck, but bonuses at the end, performance bonuses at the end of the year, those types of things, um, and how to really multitask. In, In the beginning, I was both the programmer and the first sales guy and the first marketing guy, and then we kind of split it up. With handwritten, excuse me, while I wrote the the code that actually runs the robots, I outsourced a bunch of the programming overseas um, and have kind of taken advantage of discrepancy in uh, in salaries, you know, using outsourced labor there. And I and it, it, at least early on, it was very much trying to determine what we want to handle in house, what's really core, and what can be outsourced. I felt the development of the robot writing technology and the, ri- the robot itself, that was core. But developing the coolest website or the coolest iPhone app in the world, that is still a commodity. I mean, those are commodity skills. So I figured those we could outsource and actually grow much faster because I could leverage a whole team of people for the cost it would have, I, you know, for me to have one or two people internally. So that's how we we're able to do that. The other lesson and I actually write about this for Inc. Magazine is, and it was based on some of the mistakes I I learned in in Sell It, you want to design your, if you're doing a software business, you want to design your software as a service. And to do that, and what I mean by that is you want to be a platform. You want to not be a website where people go and enter orders or not be an iPhone app where people go and enter orders, but be everywhere they want to be. If they want Salesforce, you're in Salesforce. If they want Zap, you're in Integromat, you're in Integromat and Zap. If they want HubSpot, if they want Shopify, you have to be in all these uh, spots at once. And to do that, you really have to think about that from day one and how you're going to make your business based on APIs, which then can translate to all these um, out, outlets versus just being a website. And when I built Sell It, it was a website day one. So all the code was intermingled, the front end and the back end and the logic and the data and all that was intermingled. Um, And when I started handwritten, 
I took this API platform first approach and I said, actually, let's design the iPhone app first. I knew the iPhone app wouldn't be the big way of sending handwritten notes. I knew it'd be the website because you could bulk upload. But I said, let's do the iPhone app first because that forces the developers to separate out the logic, the API from the front end, where if I had them design a website first, they could have easily made a sloppy website where it would be hard to add an iPhone app after, it'd be hard to add an Android app, all these things. But by doing it API first and, and app first, mobile app first, I forced the developers to separate all that. And that was a good way to kind of become a platform over a service. I don't know if that makes sense or if that's too techy, but that was that was one of the decisions I made early on. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, I think the, the way it boils down to is what to outsource, what not to outsource, you know, is, is really important. And then, you know, building the foundation strong from the start, having that vision of how you build the foundation of the business, you know, is really powerful. So uh, I definitely get that. I loved all those details. I hope everybody, and I'm sure a lot of people will do as well, especially if they're, yeah. you know, wanting to start a tech business because, um, yeah, you, you know, you want to make it scalable, right? Um, so that it's easy to um, help everybody and, and get your business out there and grow quickly. So I love all of that. Um, so let, let's get a little bit more into, to handwritten and what you're doing now. Right. So, um, we're all about getting results, right. And, and, you know, I guess relationships are really, you know, important in business, right? Like, you know, without relationships, I think we have business at all. So, um, how can brands create better relationships with their clients? Well, Obviously, I'm going to tell you handwritten notes are a great way to do that. But really what it is, it's bigger than that. It's having a sense of gratitude. You know, I hate to tell you or your listeners or viewers, they are not snowflakes. They're not unique. There's just like there's alternative products for handwritten. There's alternative products for, I guarantee you, pretty much anything you do out there. And people need to recognize that and appreciate the fact that their customer, their client chose you over an infinite, um, oppor- you know, an infinite uh, bowl of options, basket of options. And whether those are alternative products, complementary products, you know, competitors or something completely different, they, especially in the days of the internet, when you can go on to Yelp or G2 or any of these review sites and find another service provider that offers something similar to you. Or you could go on Amazon or Alibaba or Google or, and find any product in the world and, that's similar to you and they chose you. So I think we need to have a, a return to gratefulness, gratitude and focus on the customer. The way we do this is obviously through handwritten notes and there's a tremendous impact. And I can give you tons of stories of anecdotal, you know, stories of how this has impacted businesses. But what sticks out, I believe, for the customer when you send a handwritten note is the investment of time that you're making for that customer. Because a handwritten note requires you or somebody to sit down for three to five minutes and craft a note completely focused. You can't have your phone going off. You can't be listening uh, uh, on a phone call because you'll screw it up. You have to be totally focused on that customer for three to five minutes. And I think people really appreciate that because in this day and age of Microsoft Teams and Slack and text messages and everything else, nobody has any devoted focus time anymore. Everybody is ADHD all the time. So I really think having that gratitude for the customer and doing things like handwritten notes, customer um, appreciation days, having special sales, early access events, um, even just picking up the phone and calling your top customers, not to sell them anything, just to, to express thanks um, and you know garner feedback on what you can do better. I think these are all great ways of differentiating from the competition who is absolutely not doing this and really stand out and build customers for life. Um, I could give you one quick example. We work with a a snack box. This snack box company sends boxes of office snacks to offices all around the United States. You know, it's got granola bars and beef jerky and all the rest. And um, what they find is if they accidentally screw up your subscription box and they don't send it on time or they send you the wrong box, whatever it is, if they send you another box and a handwritten apology saying, we're so sorry for screwing up, 
um, those customers that receive that screw up box and handwritten note have a higher overall lifetime value to the brand than it had they never been screwed up in the first place. Now, of course, I don't know if that's the extra box of snacks or if it's the handwritten note or both. I think it's both and certainly the handwritten note plays, but it has a powerful and meaningful effect on their bottom line and the average lifetime value of every customer. So much so that the snack box now intentionally screws up with every customer to intentionally send them a makeup box and raise the value of all their customers across the board. Um, another example, just real quick, we have a, you know, that's kind of a large business. A small business is a piano tuner. A piano tuner only needs to be in your house once a year. He goes in your house, tunes your piano and leaves, doesn't see, see you for a year, but he set up an automation with us where after he has marked you as meeting with you, our system automatically sends you a handwritten thank you for allowing us for allowing him in your home to tune your piano. When he goes back to your house a year later, that handwritten note is often standing up on the top of the piano. Not only was it read, not only was it kept, it was kept on their most prized possession, the piano in the house. I can't think of a time when I've kept an email that long. Um, I can't, I've never taken a screenshot of a text message, printed it out and stuck it anywhere. But handwritten notes are very unique in their personal, their, the personal touch that they provide. And um, it's something we're really trying to help customers with. Yeah, I love that. Amazing stories. And, and you're so true. I still remember with my parents at home, seeing all little handwritten, like whether they're birthday things or other things like that, people do it right. And, you know, why not have it in business? It just makes so much sense. So I love, I love those stories. And so interesting with the lifetime value and that everything, how it's, you know, really linked to it. That's, that's really powerful. Um, and I guess it's interesting because, you know, we're moving more to a digital world, right? Um, yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about this and, and about digital communication and things like that. So um, what are you seeing that people are reacting to most around the digital communication that's happening in the world today? You know, we actually just did a survey of 2,000 um, uh, consumers, unrelated to handwritten, they're just 2,000 consumers, we're, we're getting ready to publish the uh, white paper on it, um, comparing text messaging, email, voice phone calls, printed cards and junk mail, I'd call it, and handwritten notes. And what's interesting is quite frankly, the number one form in many cases that people prefer is voice phone calls, not call center calls, not voice recordings dropped on your voicemail. That was a separate option on our survey and people did not like those, but the personal touch of somebody calling you and getting away from the digital communication that gets lost in your inbox. The second most preferred choice are the handwritten notes for certain occasions. You know, you're not going to send a handwritten note every time somebody joins your website or um, has an abandoned shopping cart. In those situations, you know, uh, other forms of communication are better. But they find, but we found, you know, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, customers really would like to receive a, a handwritten touch point during those points of the year. Um, email does. You know, our customers are very, uh, customers in the survey were very open and uh, uh, open to receiving emails for things like abandoned shopping carts, welcome to our website, those types of communication. So what I'd say is that you need as a brand or as a website or company, you need to have a holistic strategy encompassing everything offline and online. Your preference center, if you're sophisticated enough to create one, what, what I call a consumer preference center or customer preference center, where they can choose the types of communications they want to receive, you should allow them to opt in and opt out for each of these. But I think at the very least, if you, if you don't have a robust customer preference center, you should at least have multiple touch points of multiple forms of communication throughout the year and let them opt out of those individually. You know, I can unsubscribe to the text, I can unsubscribe to the email, uh, I only get a one handwritten note a year. It's not worth unsubscribing to. But, you know, those types of things have a very holistic approach to your outgoing communication. Yeah, I love that. So many amazing points there. And I think it all comes down to customer experience, right? It's like, what type of experience do you want? Do you want them to have a thing? And I think a lot of the great brands, a lot of the great businesses, it's all these touch points, right? Like that we yeah. touch them. We want 
have an amazing customer experience. So um, I don't know, you, you talked about all these different areas here. Is there is there certain things about personalization with customer experience and maybe certain ones that you focus on or certain ones that you're seeing in the market that really make, you know, that experience, that extra bit that's going to keep people longer? I think what it is is the, um, what technology gives a brand is, a heightened ability to comply with their own internal policies. So what I mean by this, if I tell all my salespeople they have to send an actual handwritten note for every customer they sign up, it's just not gonna get done. Maybe one out of 10 will get a handwritten note from the salesperson. If I tell the salesperson they should use the handwritten note, the handwritten service that we have here to send out handwritten notes to salespeople, maybe three out of 10 will get it, four out of 10, five out of 10 but certainly not all 10 out of 10. If I automate the handwritten note so that when a deal closes in our CRM system, an automatic handwritten note goes out the door from that sales rep to that, con that consumer, then I know 100% of the customers are having a uniform positive experience um, that you can't match otherwise. So do I think certain forms of, of, of messaging and personalization are better? Yes, I think it's very dependent on the industry you're in and, and, your, and the products you sell, that type of thing. But I think more importantly is the compliance aspect and sticking with it and creating uniformity so that when people join your brand, all customers are amazed, not just the lucky ones that you weren't, you know, you had a down day so you could actually sit there and send them handwritten notes. Um, we work with many brands where we only send handwritten notes for the online portion, but then the offline you know, if somebody walks in a brick and mortar, they don't get a handwritten note. And all that does is put more onus on them to sit down at the end of the day and write a note. It just never gets done. So I think automation, quite frankly, and playing the numbers game of knowing you're going to get in front of that many more people is as important or more so than the individual wording of any given note. That said, we do find that notes that are personalized, so it doesn't look automated. So will include the name of the product, the name of the product category they purchase, not the product. So I'm not going to say you purchased a uh, six inch leather calendar, you know, day book. I will say, thank you for purchasing a day book. Or if I'm not going to say, you know, stuff along those lines, we, we do that. And then on top of that, we offer a recommendation will say, you know, thanks so much for purchasing this snack. We thought you'd really like this snack, this other snack. And oh, by the way, if you want to give it a shot, here's a coupon for $5 off. Um, once a year around the holiday, it, a large bespoke suit company based in uh, Canada uses us to send out holiday cards to their top most loyal customers. And in that, they include a unique coupon code for um, a great discount on buying a suit. That coupon code gets a five times greater response rate than any other coupon they offer during the year. So, you know, you can include coupons there. You can just say, you know, thank you for being a customer. Um, but, I, but I really, I think the most important thing is having this ongoing guarantee that they're going to receive communication from multiple channels. So they understand how valued they are. Yeah, I love that. So many amazing points. And, you know, automation is definitely, you know, becoming more and more of a necessity, right, in business so that we can become more efficient and things like that. Do you want to maybe just expand on it a little bit more and just give us some examples? You've given some here now, but a few more yeah. examples, I guess, of how people are automating these things, like with, with handwritten notes, in terms of what instances and how they're automated with different, you know, software and, and things like that as well. Yeah, so we plug into um, Shopify using Zapier. So um, with that, we can send a handwritten note after their first purchase. We can include the product name in that. Uh, we could send them a handwritten note after they've spent $1,000. So maybe they do six purchases to get to $1,000. After that point, we could send them a handwritten note thanking them for their ongoing business. You're one of our best customers. We do that. For um, financial services providers, we've integrated with one of the major uh, CRM system specifically for financial services. And our client in this space is a franchise of uh, financial brokers. 
And so what they've done is they've created this letter, this market, this uh, financial like stock market update letter that they want to go out to their franchisees' customers every month in the form of a handwritten note. We've been integrated with their uh, customer management system where they can just say, okay, these are the 10 customers I want to receive this note or these you know, 10,000 customers that I want to receive this note. This is the stationary for my, for my version of those, you know, because my, the name of my shop is the David Wax brokerage and somebody else is the Jim Smith brokerage. I'm choosing the David Wax card. Those notes are going to appear on and it's going to have dear, uh, you know, dear Susie, not hi Susie or whatever. I can customize around it, but then the bulk of that note is going to be fully automated. So we're integrating in that way to, to basically provide information in a path that we know is going to be read by the customer, the handwritten note. Um, for automotive dealers, we're tying into their system so that after they sell a car, they get a handwritten note. Six months later, they get a oil change or miter. Um, at the birthday of the customer, they get a thank, you know, happy birthday card. And then at the holidays, they get another handwritten note. So four touch points a year. And then the next year, they get an anniversary purchase of that car, the oil change reminder, the birthday and, and the Christmas card. So um, it's really for automotive dealers, just staying top of mind and building that relationship with the automotive dealer. Um, I mean, it really runs the gamut. We work, we have a, um, a large solar panel installer that uh, installs thousands and thousands of solar panels every year. And every time they meet with a customer, an automated handwritten note, uh, just for a sales appointment to try to sell them, an automated handwritten note goes afterwards, thanking them for that opportunity to quote them um, a solar panel system. So it really truly runs the gamut. Um, we've done meal box insertion where we include a handwritten note with the meal box, welcoming to the meal box. I, I, don't, I don't know if you have stuff like this in Australia, but you can get a box of ingredients shipped to you with a recipe and you know you could do all that. So we uh, do handwritten notes included in that and we'll say even who it's been boxed by, which is kind of a lie because we don't know who's boxing it, but we will uh, say, you know, this, this was boxed up by Jim. So just to make it seem more personal. Yeah, I love that. That's that's really amazing. And thanks for yeah opening up our awareness, right, of the different possibilities out there of you know how we can use it in different industries or different situations. So that's um yeah, yeah really powerful. I love that. Um, so let's talk about maybe like you, you've given a few examples, but let's say somebody wanted to get started with handwritten, yeah. right? Like what's like maybe an average order, you know, of, of a certain amount of letters, or and then probably even more so, like. How long does it approximately take, you know, from when the order is made to then the recipients to receive them as well? Yeah. Um, so you can go on our website, and, you know, and I, I don't want this to be a sales pitch, but just real quick, you can go on our website and pay one, you know, for one handwritten card to go to one person. It doesn't have to be this big thing. That said, we have subscription plans. If you plan on sending a lot, um, those plans offer you the absolute best pricing we offer. And then we also have bulk pricing. So if you want to buy a thousand at once and send them over the course of a year, you can do that too. Um, as far as time turnaround time for small customers, if they want to go on and create a five by seven card with their logo, <clears throat> excuse me, or their photo on the back or whatever, and then we write on it, the turnaround time for that is one to two business days into the mailbox. And then it typically takes the mail if we're going across the United States, two to four days. If we're going from Phoenix to Australia, it could take a week and a half, two weeks. But um, you know, for the average business we're doing, which is North America, you know, United States and Canada, it's probably two, two to four days in the United States, four to eight days if we're going up to Canada. Yeah, awesome. No, that's really cool. It's good to just put it into context of timing, right? Of that, you know, it can actually get around. And that's good that you're global as well, even though you got the majority of the market, you know, in North America, Canada, that, you know, if I, if I do want letters, I've got, uh, you know, my wedding happening next year. So if, uh, you know, thank you very much. And if, you know, if I want to put some awesome stuff out, maybe I can put some handwritten stuff or even thank you for, for, for attending, yeah. you know, we did stuff like, thank you for coming to our engagement, things like that, even, you know, people yeah. can think about as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's really awesome that you've got that, that global presence. So um, let's, let's, 
shift the gear slightly a little bit because I know that you're featuring a lot of media, right? And what you do as well. You talked about different articles and stuff that you do. So uh, you've got your own column as well, you know, in, yeah. in Inc. Magazine, which is awesome. Um, so, you know, if, if we're wanting to get more media exposure, obviously you're at this point now from getting the media exposure as well as obviously having your own column. If we want more media exposure, what's the best way in your opinion to go about this as an entrepreneur? Well, in our case, I think it's because our business was so different and the whole notion of robots and handwriting notes combining old and new, it, it, it can naturally garner a little attention. Um, so we had that going for us. Um, with regard to media, I think being on podcasts, quite frankly, is excellent. And um, we do have a PR firm that, you know, you have to really shop around to find a good public relations firm that is both cost effective, aligned with strategically aligned, um, you know, getting you in the right outlets and creative and excited. Um, so we do have a PR firm for that. As far as Forbes, Inc., Entrepreneur, all three of those magazines have the opportunity to write for them. Um, I think Forbes now has the Forbes, Forbes Council, and I do think they charge for it. Inc. does not. Um, and I don't believe Entrepreneur Magazine does either. You just have to apply and be diligent. And I think it's a great feather in your cap to do that. And to, you know, for a while, I didn't write that much. And I'm getting back into it um, just because I think it's so important to stay in front of the media that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's amazing. You know, everybody needs content these days. So if you offer it up and it's of good quality, you can, you can typically get it in there. And I highly recommend doing that, um, especially, you know, especially if it doesn't cost you anything to do it. Um, we try to involve our customers in joint press. So for instance, we work with a um, fiber optic company that's putting fiber optic um, communication in Oklahoma. They're a big user of ours. We're trying to do joint PR with this company, OEC Fiber. And, you know, because you might be interested in the story of how OEC Fiber does it, or you might be in the, interested in the story of how we actually write the notes. So coming to the media with a whole package of here's a customer using us, here's what it's done for their business, we're the company that's enabled that. Having that full approach, I think, is, is quite, um, makes the argument quite easier to get in there. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's really just been kind of that. Another thing we've been doing a lot, and this really isn't, um, anything as far as media, but it just improves our websites is daily blogging on your website, daily high quality blogging on your website. We use something called Market Muse, uh, but you know there's a number of um, systems out there that help you uh, make sure you're writing high quality content that's going to get picked up by search engines. And we use that to ensure that the content we're putting out there is high quality and will rank quickly. Um, and then we, you know, so SEO is a really big thing around here because nobody's going to want to interview us if they can't find us. So being able to find us in Google has been, has been really great. Yeah. Awesome. So many amazing points there. Thank you so much and on all that detail. And um, I'll definitely be looking into that. And, and yeah, I love that. It's not just weekly blogging. It's like daily blogging and, and using these different mm -hmm. platforms and other things as well. That's really powerful. And um, I guess, you know, a lot of us don't necessarily like, get there and grow and scale by ourselves. Like apart from having, you know, uh, founders and people around us, a lot of the time, you know, we have coaches and mentors and other people to yeah. help us along our journey. So I'd like to hear maybe from you about how important coaching mentoring has been for you in business and, and what it's helped you to achieve as well. Yeah. So um, I'm a part of a, a couple of different groups. I'm a part of something here in, in Arizona called the Genius Network, which is um, actually some of my clients got us, got me into it. And it's a group of like-minded people, a uh, bit of an arrogant name, but uh, there's some people in that group that are very powerful. Um, and that's been a good way to meet people and kind of bounce ideas. Um, and then there's things like Vistage and YPO, Young President's Organization, just ways to bounce ideas. For me, I don't have a mentor per se, I have sounding boards. I have other people that are going through similar things that I can call up and we can 
co mutually complain about how things are going and you know use them as sounding boards and get their ideas. But I don't have an elderly mentor in my head that um, that I can really call upon. Um, some books that have done that, The E Myth by Michael Gerber has been very influential in my own life. Um, if you've read it, it's a very simple book. Basically, you have to find time to work on the business instead of working in the business. I highly recommend that book. The E stands for entrepreneur, not email or anything like that. It's, it's E myth. Another book that recently I've been really um, trying to leverage is Traction by Gino uh, Wickman. Traction is a book about his EOS, which is his entrepreneur operating system, his method of making meetings more impactful, um, uh, really goal set, move your business forward. And we've implemented the level 10 meeting at handwritten. Um, so my management team on a weekly basis, we get together, we use the level 10 meeting, which is his framework, the name of his meeting framework to really kind of uh, battle the, the week's issues and, and, and quickly within an hour and a half, get to the bottom of what's going on in the organization. It's a great book. Um, you know, if you actually really get in strong with Gene, uh, with EOS, you're supposed to have a facilitator, which is a very expensive prospect. And I haven't gone down that path. I've just watched a lot of YouTube videos and read his book. Uh, but it's been, it's been very, very helpful within our organization and, and, and help keep us all aligned. Um, we also try to do a number of um, feedback, 360, or I guess 180 feedback discussions with our with our team. So just today, for instance, we're running another uh, employee SAT survey with our team, just trying to get their feedback and, and suggestions on how to improve things around here from them. So I'm looking, I, I hate to say this, looking down in addition to looking up, you know, I'm looking down to my team members for for their uh, guidance and uh, as well. Yeah, awesome. So many awesome points there, and I guess it shows that there's different ways that we can be mentored by people. Like you said, it can be simply from a book and and apply these things like that, yeah. or it can be from actual people where we can, whether it's bouncing off ideas or or getting direct, you know, coaching and mentoring and stuff like that. So it's a really great realization that you know, no matter what, where you're at in your journey, there's still so much to do. And I actually got traction the book recently. I haven't read it yet, which is hilarious. Yeah. So it's awesome that you mentioned that. So I'll definitely be uh, diving into that very soon. Yeah. We, you know, in Vistage, they talk, at least our Vistage chapter, uh, Vistage is another one of these kind of round table groups for business leaders. They, they talked a lot about it and I finally broke down and got it. And um, I wanted to structure, I wanted to structure my management meeting and honestly, it was one of these things where I'm like, here's a structure, let me apply it. You know, any structure is better than no structure. So I just took the first structure I could find and did it. And it's been working out quite well, I have to say. It's a it's a good, it's a good framework for running meetings. Yeah, love it. Awesome stuff. Um, so you know, we've done so much today. It's been so much awesome value that you've done. So as we're, I guess, starting to wrap this thing up, um, what else would you maybe like to share about your business or maybe even more so what, what one key piece of advice, you know, would you like to give, you know, to all the entrepreneurs um, watching and listening today? Yeah. So uh, the best advice I ever got uh, on entrepreneurship I got in college university is uh, came from Conan O'Brien. We brought him to speak at our, at our university. Um, he had just gotten his own show um, and he was still rather green and he was also very, very thoughtful. And what he said was always get in over your head. And here I am 24, 25 years, actually longer, 28 years later, still thinking about that advice that I received 28 years ago. And I think getting in over your head, pushing yourself beyond your comfort level, forcing yourself to grow um, is really the path to success for an entrepreneur or for a sports star, any, you know, athlete, anything else. So, um, I think getting, always get in over your head is, is, um, the best advice I could give. The other thing, quite frankly, is the best day to start your next venture is today because tomorrow you're going to be married. The next day you're going to have kids. You're going to have new responsibility, new responsibilities, new bills, new things tying you down. So the sooner you can do it, the sooner you can jump in. And I'm not talking about analysis paralysis and spending months agonizing over the numbers and making sure you have every dot 
uh, everything dotted and crossed. I'm saying actually do it because so many people also end up with analysis paralysis. So um, yeah, just get in and start it. Yeah, I love that. So many amazing points there. So yeah, we connected through our networks. For, uh, learned about your awesome journey from selling Sellit, and um, you know, after scaling it for eight years, to more recently founding Handwritten. You know, where you have brought back the lost art of uh, letter writing, which is amazing. And you know, you, you're changing the game. You know, with, with customer experience, which is awesome. And um, you know, I'm sure the demand for handwritten letters will continue to increase. You know, in the digital world that that is growing today. So, you know, you're you're an awesome guy, David, and I'm sure you will continue to innovate you know, through business. So I'm very grateful that we connected. I look forward to working with you in the future. So how can people find you and get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm David at handwritten. If you want to email me, uh, H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-E-N. So there's a Y in the middle of handwritten. Um, You can find uh, handwritten on Twitter um, at handwritten. Uh, Just visit our website, request samples. You'll get a whole beautiful sample pack. So you can see for yourself if these pass, pass, uh, you know, the, the sniff test or the, or more, more the smudge test, you know, smudge thing can make sure it, it, it smudges. So yeah, those are really the best ways. And um, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure being on your show. Very welcome, David. Yeah, everybody definitely got to check David out. You want to get those customer experience handwriters out to your, your clients and, and everybody else in your life, then it is a must. So Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. Please like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis, or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way you want to know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So remember to design your growth and results. Have a great day.